Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Estimator Express software skills course. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join the training. I hope you feel uh, by the end of the training that it's um, time that's been well invested. Um, my name's Olivia. Uh, I'm one of the trainers um, here at HBXL. I've been with the company for um, about seven years now, um, and I work on some of the help materials, help videos that you might have seen, and um, also I deliver the software skills training. So um, we'll dive straight in because I know you guys are busy people. Um, I've just got a couple of PowerPoint slides, and then we will um, get stuck in with the software straight away. So the software skills course is aimed at people who are relatively new to the software. It's a beginner's basic kind of a training course. And the idea is that we want to give you the confidence to use Estimator Express um, so that you can achieve a number of things. Firstly, we want you to be able to speed up your estimating. Um, we know we're going through very bu busy times at the moment. Um, the less time you can spend doing your estimating and your admin, the better. So we want to help you with that. Um, we want to help you um, improve the accuracy of your estimates. So we want to make sure that you are um, not missing anything out, um, that you're getting your costs bang on, that your materials are, your material prices um, are correct for the times, because we, we all know um, that inflation is um, a big um, consideration at the moment. Um, so we want to help you factor in price rises, we want to help you produce professional looking quotes with very little effort on your part. And the bottom line, uh, literally here, is we want to help you become more profitable. So that's our reason for being here today. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a, a quick run through what we're gonna cover during the course. Um, we've got four different sessions. Um, each of them is running from 12.30 till 2.30. So today we're going to um, start on module one and we're going to dive straight in with creating an estimate and we're going to use a um, standard job template to create an estimate and we're going to work through entering dimensions, um, selecting specifications um, and then estimating construction costs and some preliminary and subcon subcontract costs. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, Module one over the years has grown as the features um, of our software have developed. So module one will probably actually finish on uh, during our next next session on on Thursday, which is the 16th of September. So we'll finish off module one and then we will move on to module two on Thursday, where we will look at the price books, uh, the price book in Estimator Express. And we'll go through how we can edit the labor rates, how we can do uh, price downloads, how we can edit material prices, how we can add materials to the price book. And I'll also show you how you can review your plant subcontracts and sundry resources in there. And finally, we'll look at the favorite merchants feature, which allows you to pick and mix which merchants. So if you've got a linked merchant account um, with Travis Perkins, for example, or a uh, keyline, we'll show you how you can select different merchants for different uh, material types. So then module three, which will be um, next week, next Tuesday, the 21st of September, we will look at what specifications are in the software, what, they, what their function is. Um, we'll, I'll talk you through the different specifications and um, what type of work you would use them for. And then I'll talk you through tailoring the specifications to the way you like to work. So I'll show you how you can swap in different resources, different materials, um, how you can change the what we call usage factor, the rates of usage of resources. And I'll also touch on how you can set your default overhead profit and inflation um, rates within the software. And then the final module is all about the output side of things. So the, um, the build program, the Gantt chart, um, data reports, and the customer quotation um, feature. So we'll, we'll go through those on the 23rd of September. So if you can attend all those sessions, that would be brilliant. Hopefully uh, by the end of that, you'll have a really good um, feel for how the software works from end to end. So how each session will work is as you've seen, I'm just gonna focus on a few different aspects of the software. 
you'll be able to see my screen. Um, and hopefully, ideally, I think it said in the emails that you've been sent, um, you will have two screens. So if you've got a laptop and a second screen, that's the ideal scenario. So you can have Estimator Express on one screen and um, go to webinar with my screen on the other so you can follow along and um, do the tasks at your end simultaneously. Please do ask questions as we go along. If there's anything you're unsure of or anything additional you want to ask, on um, GoToWebinar, there is a question section that allows you to do that. So I'll just quickly describe how you can find that because sometimes GoToWebinar likes to hide it. So with GoToWebinar, there's like a gray bar that can be pinned to the right-hand side of your screen. On the top there, there's an orange button with an arrow. If you click on that, it will expand your GoToWebinar dashboard. Within there, there's one section called questions. If you click on the arrow next to where it says questions, that will open up like a question box, a chat box. So if you click in there, you can type and um, your questions will appear at my end. So if you can find that question box, just type me a hello. That will confirm A, that you can hear me right now, which is always reassuring to know, and B, that you know how to get in touch if you've got any questions. So I'll just repeat that explanation just um, in case you didn't catch it first time. So GoToWebinar has a gray bar, which is sometimes pinned to the right hand side of your screen. If you click on the orange button with an arrow, that will expand that dashboard, that control panel. Within there, there's a section called questions. Click on the arrow next to questions. Um, that will open up a, a chat box and um, you should be able to type in there hello. So I can see a few highs and hellos popping up, so that's brilliant. Okay, so yeah, please do um, use that question box to fire your questions to me as we go through. We'll also try to have some um, Q&A time at the end if there's anything um, you would like to know. Um, I will try and answer your questions as we go along. If it's something that's a bit more involved that I need um, to refer to tech support, sometimes I will ask them to give you a call or, or drop you an email afterwards. Um, if it, and also if it takes us off on a bit of a tangent because we are quite tight for time. Um, so at the end of the session, if we've got time, I'll do just a few quick questions. I call it like a mini quiz where we just go through some of the key points that we've touched on during the training. Um, if you ever need to rush off at any point, I know. Um, Sometimes people have meetings to rush to and stuff. If you just want to drop me a line to let me know that's what you're doing, then that's absolutely fine. I understand you're busy people. OK, so during our training, we're going to be estimating a really simple brick and block lean to extension. So I've put some diagrams in. I, I don't suppose it actually needs diagrams. Um, but um, I always say when you're learning to use the software, don't start out with uh, estimating your next job if it's a if it's a complex um, if it's a complex job it's a good idea to learn the basics on a simple uh, a simple estimate such as this type that we're doing here um, just to build up your confidence learn where things are in the software how things work and then you can move on to you know, bigger and and more more complex projects um, as your skills develop. OK, so let's dive into the software now. Um, so if you haven't already, if you could open up your copy of Estimator Express. So I'm going to start with the very basics. Um, before I just do that, I just got a couple of quick questions, actually. I would like to ask you guys just to get a feel for the type of work that you are doing. So I'm going to launch this first. Um, poll question so hopefully that's popped up at your end you can interact with these polls so you can click any of the answers that apply so apologies for the missing question mark that seems to have been removed by GoToWebinar so the first question is what kind of work do you tend to carry out so if you could tick any of the boxes that apply to you and your business um, that would give me a good feel for type of work that you do so it's a multiple uh, answer kind of a question so you can tick as many as are relevant to you. Okay, so I'll share what uh, has popped up. So it looks like um, 
everyone who's apply, re replied sorry, is doing extension work, renovations, loft conversions, and the, uh, some of you doing conservatories. So that's um, really interesting to know. So hopefully what we're going through today um, will be very relevant to you. Um, and then the second question is about your usage of Estimator Express so far. So just again, to give me a feel for how experienced you are really. So how much experience do you have of using Estimator Express? None, little, some, or quite a lot of you. Tick the one that feels like the best description of where you are with your um, time with Estimator Express. Okay, so so I'm whizzing through these quite quickly. Um, I'm just conscious that we've got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, so it's ranging from none to some, which is fair enough, which is kind of where I'd expect you guys to be for this particular course that you're on. So that's great. So I'm going to start from uh, the ground and um, work upwards. So we'll start with the basics. So hopefully, um, if you've been using the software a little bit, we'll be filling some of the gaps in your knowledge and building on what you know already. If you're starting from scratch, that's absolutely fine. That's that's what the software, um, sorry, that's what the training is um, catering for. So that's no trouble. OK, so bearing that all in mind then. So when you open your software, you will start here on the dashboard screen. Now, the dashboard screen is like the hub, the heart, the heart of your um, software. Um, just to help you orientate yourself on the left hand side here, we have what's called the navigator so that allows you to navigate through the different screens within the software. And then along the top of the screen, we've got what our developers called a, rib a ribbon, but it's just a, a menu with multiple tabs on it. So those tabs and the buttons that are available will change depending on what screen you're looking at. So what I'd like us to do first using the navigator on the left is to click where it says jobs. This will open up the job screen which shows a list of all of the estimates that you have previously carried out. So if you've been into Estimator Express and had a go at some estimates you will see a list of the ones you've been working on here. So just a quick run through the buttons that we've got. So we've got the jobs tab at the top of the screen. So from there, you can create a new job. So if you want to start a new estimate, you can click there. You can open a job. So you would click on the job you want to open and then click open job. You can copy a job. Um, there's a couple of reasons why you might want to copy a job. Firstly, if you want to make adjustments to an estimate, but keep the original intact, then you can copy it give it um, a name version two, variation two or whatever, and then you can make changes to the copy um, whilst keeping the original. You can delete a job, um, does what it says on the tin, take care before you use that button um, because unless you have backed up an, an estimate, a job to somewhere else on your computer, when you click delete, it's gone for good. So um, often there's no reason to get rid of old jobs, um, if you're certain you really don't need it, then of course you can use that button there. And then we've got an import button. So if you ever need to pass estimates between different computers, so if you've got more than one license of the software and you want to, your colleague sent you an estimate and you want to import it into your software, you can do it using this button. Also, if you have backed up an estimate, you can re-import it back into your software. So when you first, uh, when you create an estimate and then you close it down, you'll be prompted as to whether you want to save it and where you want to save it to. And the file location is shown on this screen here. So you see we've got a number of different columns. You might need to scroll a little bit to the right, depending on the side of your size of your screen. You'll see we've got this file location column, and that shows you where each job has been saved. So if you ever want to back up your jobs, you can right click where it says file location and click where it says show in file explorer. So that will open up Windows Explorer. You can then copy the files if you want to save them to um, OneDrive or Google Drive, or you've got an external hard drive or whatever system it is that you use, you can copy those jobs and save them 
uh, somewhere safe so you've got a backup copy of them and then as I say if you ever want to bring them back into your software if you've deleted them you can use that import job button so as you um, create your estimates this list here will grow if you want to change any of the properties any of the fields for any of your jobs you can do so by clicking on it on the right hand side you'll see um, some job details here if you want to change anything like you want to ch change the job name you can click the edit button and then you can just over type the job name or the description the job number and you can also change the status so statuses um, can be useful when you've got a large list of jobs like I've got here and you want to keep track of where you're up to with your different estimates and it also allows you to track success so um, you can mark as un unsuccessful if you don't win a job and then you can see your the proportion of successful versus uh, unsuccessful jobs so I'm going to click cancel to close that for now so this is the job screen so from here um, you can create new jobs you can edit the details of the jobs you've got um, and you can open up any existing jobs as well before we start creating uh, our estimate today I just want to show you the settings tab again on the top menu in here we have some different settings including the software theme that might be of interest to you there's some dark themes so if you um, tend to do your estimating in the evening or at night when it's uh, darker than the dark themes I think are easier on the eye so you might want to change to one of those um, here we've also got the estimator express options so if you click on that button there um, from here you can change all sorts of different settings within the software including things like the, the default VAT rate you see we've got a menu on the left hand side here so if, if we click registered user if your company name changes or your address changes then you can change those details here um, one thing I'd like to show you in here the next option down sorry the, the next item on the menu is jobs and the top option there is to show the new estimate wizard when you're creating a new job make sure that box is ticked um, what this will do is it will allow us to type in our client details choose our specification and so on as you create your estimate um, this is an option you can have it switched on or not but I think if we have it switched on we can all input those details now it's also really good to have it switched on because when you create your customer quote you're obviously going to need your client details in there and it's easy to forget to put them in if you don't have this box ticked but I'll, I'll show you what what it brings up in a moment when we get to it okay so make sure that top um, tick box is ticked and click close and now let's get started with our estimate so we want to click back onto the jobs tab and we want to click create new job so you might find this screen a bit bamboozling to start with um, but basically there are four different ways that you can create and create an estimate so the top option is to use a standard job template so this allows you to pick from a selection of pre-designed templates for new builds bungalows extensions conservatories and detached garages so if you're doing um, an estimate um, for one of those types of uh, project then the standard job template is probably going to be the quickest way to put your estimate together and that's because we've done a lot of the work for you in terms of um, picking out which elements you might need for that particular type of job and also um, once you've typed in the overall dimensions for the build it will filter down through the through the job template so that's a really quick way of estimating however if you are estimating renovation work if you are doing an attic conversion or a garage conversion we don't yet have standard job templates set up for those so you'll need to select the second option the custom job template 
The third option we've got is to import plans from Plans Express. So if you use Plans Express and you have um, either done a takeoff in Plans Express or you've designed um, a project from scratch in Plans Express, then you can import your plans into Estimator Express. Estimator Express will hoover up the dimensions and your specification choices and uh, put together a really quick estimate for you that way. But of course, that's dependent on you having Plans Express. The fourth option you're probably not going to need to use. Um, you probably only want to use this option if you're an advanced user and you want to create and use your own estimating calculators. It gives you added flexibility on top of using the um, job templates, um, but it does require quite, excuse me, a detailed understanding of how the software works. Um, so if you can, I would suggest you always start with a standard job template. It's the quickest and the easiest way of um, putting together your estimate. Okay, so if you click on the top option, the quote template library will open up. I'm just going to click on the top, double click on the bar at the top to make it full screen so we can see the full range we've got here. So to start with, it shows you all of the templates. If you want to filter this down, use the building type drop down and you can home in just on extensions, for example which also includes conservatories. They don't have their own separate category. Or you can just look at detached garages or whatever it is you want to look at. So if we select extensions. So when you select an extension template, if I just dip back into the slideshow for a second. So what an extension template allows you to estimate Hopefully this will seem really obvious, but I'm just spelling it out um, so that you're 100% sure on what the software is doing. Um, so the software will allow you to form this opening in the existing connecting wall. It will allow you to plaster the connecting wall, taking into account that opening that you've already put in there. And then of course it will estimate the all the new elements in the extension, so the walls, roofs, doors, windows, electrics, plumbing, any fitting out that you do in there. So we're going to select the fifth template along, which is called the Lean to Single Story Extension. You'll see there's various different configurations for different um, roof, roof types, building shapes, um, but we're just going to go with this, the simple Lean to Single Story Extension. Um, sorry, I've just I might pause every now and again. It's while I'm checking my questions and I've just seen Jeff. You said you've got a problem. It's saying it's not available on this version. Um, Jeff, you're saying the lean to extension is not available and um, which version are you using as well? If you know off the top of your head, that would be handy to know. So, um, yeah, we selected the lean to story single story extension. And because we tick that tick box in the settings, this is the screen that comes up. This allows us to give the job a name. Um, it allows us to select the specification we want to use for this project. It allows us to put in the client details, select the build program and so on. So we can do a lot of the um, specifying before we even get into the estimate here. So yeah, it's just a case of entering a job name. So I'm guessing you probably have your own systems for naming jobs. You might use the client name. You might use um, the um, the address of the project. So feel free to use whatever uh, is meaningful to you. I'm just going to call this training estimate for now. You can call it training estimate um, if that works for you as well. Job description, you'll see we've got a drop down box and you can select the most appropriate description. If you want to use a slightly different um, description, you can. So for example, this we could leave it as a single store extension or we could select lean to extension or if you wanted to change it, if you wanted it whoops, to be a lean to rear extension, that's fine. You can just type in there. Just take care to make sure that um, you type in a sensible 
description, it can appear in the customer quotation. So make sure you spell everything correctly. So for today, actually, I'm just gonna select a very generic extension job description. The job number, the job reference is automatically assigned by Estimator Express. If you want to use your own numbers, you can. You just need to make sure it's one that hasn't been used before. So I, I couldn't use numbers 1 to 19 because I've used them already. But if you wanted to start with like 001 or something, that would be fine. If you Again, if you've got your own systems set up already. Next, let's fill in the client address detail. So if we click on the right hand side, we can type in the client's name. So I'm just going to put some sample information in here. You can type something in at your end as well. So yeah, I'm just going to put some random numbers in here. So you want to make sure your client details are filled in at some point because they do appear in your customer quotation. You want to present your quote professionally, of course, so make sure you get those um, looking neat. If the client address is the same as the site address, tick this box at the bottom and then those address details will be copied across to the site address. So whenever you're doing extensions, um, renovations and so on, where the address is the same, tick that box. Once you're happy with the address details there, click update. Okay. Then we can um, select the price book we're going to use. Now, nine times out of 10 or 99 times out, out of 100, um, our Estimator Express users are only using the master price book. Um, we'll go through this during module two, but the master price book um, is set up, um, it, it is linked to our online pricing um, through Price Tracker Plus. So those prices are kept live and up to date. If you create your own price book, you then have to manually review and keep all of your prices up to date. So we recommend in most cases to only use the master price book um, to save yourself a lot of work. So normally you won't have to do anything here where it says price book, you can skip over that. Again, with estimating calculators, you don't need to do anything there. So what the software is doing is it's selecting the estimating calculators that you will need for the template that you've just selected. And it will also add in a load of preliminary um, and subcontract estimating calculators so that you can go in and add any extras that aren't included in the template. Um, so yeah, you don't need to consider the estimating calculators. You do need to think about the project start date. Um, often you're not going to know this at the outset of an estimate, I'm sure. If you can just put an approximate start date in um, to start with, that's a good idea. And then you can go into your build program and tweak the start date once you have a, a more concrete um, date for that. Um, the build program start date is obviously really important in terms of um, the Gantt chart, the build program itself, but it also feeds dates into any of the data reports that use dates. So things like um, material ordering schedules and profit forecasts, cash flow reports and so on, they will all make use of the dates that come from your build program. So you do need to make sure it's accurate uh, when you come to use those things. But for now we can just put um, an estimated start date. So let's just pick the 1st of November as an example. And then you can um, select whether you want to use um, the automatically calculated bulk program or a template. So the automatically calculated build program will take the labor times from within your estimate. So it will look at the calculations um, for all of the labor in the estimate and formulate the build program based on those. The other way of working is to use a, a standard build program template. So that's an out of the box template that you can then edit yourself. So today, if you select the automatically calculated build program, 
and it, in our fourth session I'll talk you through how that all works. Um, you can always select a pre, um, a pre like um, populated template if you want to um, in the future but I'll show you the automatically calculated one for the purposes of our training. The final thing we need to think about is our specification. So if we look in the drop down box here, you'll see we've got a number of different specifications for different types of work. I'll go into a lot more detail about this in module three. Um, but for now, you'll see we've got three extension specifications, two are for timber frame um, construction. One is uh, just a standard brick and block extension specification. So we're going to use that one. You'll see we've also got a number of new build specifications. The uh, extension specifications um, have a couple of key differences from the new build spec. Firstly, they um, use the plant that's appropriate for where space is limited. So it will um, specify a mini digger rather than a JCB, for example. It will also allow more time to complete the different labor tasks. So it recognizes that when you're doing an extension, you're, you tend to be doing shorter runs. You are going to have to take care of the existing property. Um, access might be limited. All of those things will just slow down the work a bit, won't they? So extension, the extension spec allows more time for the building work to be done. OK, so select the extension spec as your main specification. And then we have what we call mini specs. So these allow you to, to select some key materials or systems that you're using for this particular job. It will further refine, further tailor the extension specific, specification that you've selected. So first of all, you can select a price allowance for the brickwork. So you may say, well, we're using um, a nib stock brick that's 80 pence per brick. So you select the brickwork now. That will obviously have um, a fairly significant impact on your estimates versus if you were using a, a £1.40 facing brick. Next, you can select the roof tiling system that you're going to use. So we're using pan tiles, plain tiles, slates. You might see the odd mini spec option in here that you haven't got. That's because I've actually set up some of my own mini specs and that's something you can do if you want to go down that route um, but for now let's select the pan tile option you'll see we've got one that's for extension or renovation and one that's for new build the difference between those two options again is the labor time that it will allow so make sure you select the extension or renovation option that will take into account the fact that you're um, your roofing is going to take perhaps a little bit longer. Um, I think it allows maybe 20% longer um, for extension work because you're working on smaller areas, but um, more tricky, more complex uh, work sometimes. So all it, all it is is a case of working through any of the relevant mini specs and selecting the materials that you're going to use. Say for guttering, we've got a whole raft of different guttering systems more than I knew existed that's for sure um, I believe the um, specification default is to have a plastic half round gutter 112 mil to 60, 68 mil downpipe um, if you wanted to select a different guttering system then you could if you're not concerned about that particular aspect of the estimate at this point you can just leave it set to same as specification some of the mini specs are not going to be relevant. So you'll see we've got a couple of flat roof options here. So the waterproofing and the fascias, barge balls and soffits. Clearly, we don't need to think about that for this particular estimate, which is a lean to extension. So we can just ignore those. The software isn't going to be um, worrying about those. All of the options are listed for um, each of um, the different options here. OK, so I'm going to leave all the rest set to the same as specifications. Hopefully you're getting an idea of how they work. Um, 
just a quick one to say for the plant and labour for the excavation as I mentioned when you're using an extension specification it will default to using a mini digger however if you're working where space is really limited and you're having to use um, manpower to dig the excavations then you, there's a manual labour option there okay Mick I've just seen that you've said you went straight into the main quote, quote template screen the new job window didn't come up okay not to worry um that was to do with that option in in the settings it's not it's not the end of the world though we'll catch up with you in a second and all of these different um options all the specification options you can actually review from within the estimate as well okay so the last thing i just want to flag up to you before we click create is that you can at this point review your profit markup so you can set your overhead and profit percentages for this particular estimate from here you might not want to do that at this point you might want to do the estimate and then have a look at your profit markup at the end that's fine you can do that from within the estimate as well um, you can also review your inflation rates for this particular job so of course inflation is a really important thing to consider at the moment um, our sales and marketing director um, Joanna I was talking to her yesterday and she was saying that material inflation has been 20% in the last um, 12 months I think it might have been July 2020 to July 2021 so if you're estimating work that's six nine twelve months ahead and you're not factoring in inflation then you're um, going to be carrying out work that you're not making any money on and you're potentially making a loss on so um, yeah infl inflation is, is something that's essential to be thinking about at this point so what um, this is doing here is it's saying it's going to add five percent onto all of these different costs starting 12 weeks from today so um that five sorry what that five percent mean it means is this five percent over the next 12 months so it might not actually be high enough these figures might need tweaking upwards but this is the the software default settings okay so i'm going to click close for now so once you fill all that out you can click create job and the software will take a few moments to pull together all that information so it's going to select your chosen specification with all those mini spec resources that you um, chose it's going to start putting together your build program with the start date you selected and so on it's going to take a sip of my drink of water while it does that okay Mick I can see that you've got it sorted there that's brilliant okay so far so good everybody is it all making sense so far I'm sure if you've been in and done the odd estimate before none of this is entirely new to you but yeah let me know how you're feeling about it all so far so once we've clicked create job we will end up in the main quote template screen at the top of the screen you will see the overall template dimension so it's super simple for this particular template that we've selected but if you have selected a new build or a more complex um, extension you will have multiple dimensions to, uh, to enter in here not just one or two so we start by putting in the overall dimensions of our extension here and what what will happen is the main quote template will use those dimensions to autofill the data throughout the estimate so if we keep the um, the width of the or I should say the projection of the estimate at three meters change the width of it to five meters uh, as an example you'll see that when I click elsewhere on screen or press the enter key the job costs on the top right hand corner are recalculated so that's why the software pauses for a moment so the dimensions I've entered here will be used to calculate the length of walls um, various roof dimensions together with the pitch obviously the area of the floor um, 
the internal area of the walls for uh, plastering and decoration, the ceiling dimensions and so on. So what the software is doing is it's in intelligently inserting those dimensions wherever they're needed throughout the estimate. So as I said, the job costs are on the top right hand corner here. So the construction cost is the, um, if you hover your cursor over it, you'll see those um, charts pop up. The construction costs are your actual costs. So that excludes any profit or overheads. So your profit and overheads are shown separately here. So this figure will be dependent on the profit and overhead percentages that you have um, typed in for your job. And then the sale price is the price to the customer. So that includes um, your overheads and profit markup. Okay, so as you make any changes to the dimensions or the estimating options, those costs will update live so you can see the impact that it's having on your estimate costs. Okay, so underneath our overall dimensions here, we've got some key um, estimating options and dimensions. So again, the options that you select here and the, dim the dimensions that you type in here will filter through to the different elements of your estimate. So we've got some global options here for allowing plastering and decoration. So if you want to plaster and decorate throughout your project, leave those ticked. Um, if, for example, you were getting a, a subcontract plasterer in to do the plastering and you wanted him to quote for that part of the job, you could untick that box there and then put your plastering in as a subcontract quotation. But if you want to estimate it within um, your estimate, leave that ticked. So I'm going to skip is automatically untick decoration when you untick plastering as well. I'll leave that ticked for now. Um, untick decoration as well. Internal finishing for the external walls, we'll leave that ticked as well. Decorate fascias and soffits. So this is for if you are um, going to be using softwood fascias and soffits. Um, let's say we're going to use the UPVC one, so we will Leave that unticked. Um, then we can have a look at the cavity wall foundation depth. So as uh, standard, it's set to 0.9 meters, but let's say we need slightly deeper foundations for this project. I'm gonna change that to 1.2 meters. Again, as soon as I click elsewhere on the screen, um, that dimension I've entered there will revise the construction costs at the top of the screen. Now a quick way to move between these input boxes is to click into one and then press the tab key on your keyboard and that will move you to the next box. The tab key is um, on the left hand side of your keyboard it's with two arrows pointing in opposite directions. So there was an option here for single skin wall foundation depth but for this particular um, extension we're estimating here there's no internal block wall so we don't need to worry about that ceiling height downstairs of course we need to consider so if the ceiling height were 2.3 or um, 2.6 or whatever you could change that here but we'll leave it set to 2.4 for now the roof pitch is obviously another important consideration let's say we've got a really low pitch here 22 degrees I'm going to change that Again, I can press the tab key to move into the next input box. The software will do, do its quick recalculation as we do that. The tile lath or batten, they're often known as, aren't they? Uh, spacing is set to 300 mil. If you are um, using plain tiles, then that would be something more like 100 mil, wouldn't it? But that's fine for the pan tiles that we're using, the like concrete interlocking type tiles. Then we've got soffit width to the eaves, 200 mil at the moment, and soffit width to the gables downstairs set to 150. So you can tweak those here. Any changes you make will automatically appear in the, um, the roof section of the quote below. So we've, we've picked out and highlighted some of the really important 
dimensions and options that you will want to consider. If you click the standard settings button on the right hand side here, you'll see that we have a number of different settings for different elements of the build. You can set these in the way you usually work. Again, they will um, apply to the entire estimate and you can also save your particular settings as default. So the next time you create an estimate, it will automatically have your standard settings in there. So you don't have to go through this process repeatedly, just do it once, click save as defaults, and your standard settings will um, be available or will they, they will be the default for each estimate you create. So if, for example, we have a look at roofs, you'll see we've got the standard settings for truss roof, rafter centres, joist centres for cut roofs, are there eaves fascia boards, um, things like is there sarking boards, so if you're working north of the border you might want to switch that to yes. Are there barge boards to gables, rafter centers for cut roofs, and so on. So these are all set to sensible default settings, but it might be that you work slightly differently. If that's the case, you can tweak any of these dimensions here. And as I say, click save defaults. So if, for example, I'll just change that sarking board one to yes. And then when we come to the roof, we'll be able to see that that change has followed through. You don't need to do it at your end. So the, the point of having these standard settings set up is that it will save you a ton of time. So if you are estimating a more complex roof, so if you're doing a roof with multiple sections, so if it were an apex roof with two valleys coming off it and maybe a lean to projection as well, the settings that you choose here will filter down into each of those different sections of the roof. That means you don't have to go into the different sections and make those changes multiple times. So when you have a few few minutes, um, we, we shan't do it now, but if you've got a few minutes just to go through those standard settings here, it might be that there's not actually that much that you need to change. Um, if you don't use garage conversions, for example, you won't necessarily need to look at that tab at all, or IC, if you don't use ICF or SIPs and so on. There might only be certain areas you need to review. But spend a few minutes just going down the list and then click save as defaults, then the software will remember your preferences in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna click okay for now. And then if we scroll down a little way, we will come to the section which deals with the resource specification. So this is literally a copy of what you've just seen in the new estimate wizard when you created your estimate. So you'll see your mini spec selections there. If that um, extension wizard didn't pop up for you, like Mick, you said it didn't um, first time around, you can always just click edit specification and mini specs and make your choices in here. It doesn't matter where you do it, to be honest. If you need to go back at a later date and make any changes, if the customer says, no, actually, I'd like to use this, I'm going to use a 90 pence facing brick instead, you can just come in and make the change. Um, if I change that to 90 pence, then click OK. The software will then do another recalc, as it does when you change um, any of the options here, and it will tell you the impact on the price of the job. Okay, so that's the specification. If you're happy with your specification, then you can get started with estimating the construction elements of the job. So if you scroll down the screen, um, the sections are laid out in a um, hopefully a fairly intuitive way. So we start with external walls, then look at floors, roofs, uh, and so on. So as we selected, um, Actually, I didn't talk to you about it. When you're selecting your template, you can um, choose between the different finishes. So you can choose a brick finish, rendered finish, or stone finish. Because we were um, using the default brick finish when we selected the template, it has automatically specified brick and block cavity walls. However, if you need to use a different external wall spec, you can simply 
click on it in this uh, drop down box. If you're estimating a two story building, then there will be a second drop down for the upstairs walls. So you can um, quickly and easily estimate half and half. So if you've got half brick, half rendered walls, you can just uh, select the appropriate spec for the upstairs and downstairs. OK, so we've chosen our wall, external wall specification. We can then um, see a couple of key dimensions for the wall. So we can see the overall wall width and the cavity width. So these are set to 340 at the moment, but you might say, well, I'm extending a property and the existing walls are 300 mil wide. So you can overwrite that here and the cavity is only 100 mil. So again, just click in, highlight the figures you want to change. And then if you click elsewhere on screen, it will um, take that change into account with its calculations. So of course, that's only a couple of dimensions for our walls. If we press the DIMS button, so DIMS is just short for dimensions because that's a really uh, ridiculously long word to fit on screen. Um, we can click this dimensions button here and that will allow us to review the dimensions for the wall as a whole. Now, in Estimator Express, when we talk about walls, we don't actually just mean walls. We mean everything from foundations through footings um, to the plastering, the decoration, the skirting of that wall. That's all done in one go. And that's because we can use um, the same set of dimensions to estimate all those things. Um, so we do it in one go. So you can see the um, dimensions here have been taken from that main quote template screen. So it's worked out. We've got two side walls at three meters and a five meter wall. So the total length of wall for this extension is 11 meters. The wall height, it's taken from the ceiling height that we typed into the main quote template. The area of openings is currently set to zero. That is because we haven't actually estimated any openings in our extension yet. So when you open the um, extension job template, it has already got some data in because you saw there was it had allowed for a three by six extension. So the, the walls are estimated already, but it hasn't automatically put any openings in there. So that's a really important thing to remember. It doesn't know if you want windows. It doesn't know if you want bifolds, PVC doors or whatever. So until you estimate any openings, the um, the template will assume there aren't any. OK, so which is why the area of openings is currently set to zero. When we work our way down the screen and estimate for our bifold and our window, it will then add those areas of openings to the walls. Or I should say it will deduct those area of openings from the wall. So it knows that it needs to net off that bit of brickwork and insulation and plasterboard and so on. So we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, you've probably noticed that these input boxes are color coded. Um, they, they're a bit of a key, really. If you hold your cursor over an input box, it will tell you where it's coming from. So it's saying for the height of the main wall there, that dimension is coming from the quote template. Um, the reason it's telling you that is that you could override it if you wanted to. So I could change this to 2.5 meters. If I put number lock on um, and it then turns red. That is just a flag up the point that I have overridden the dimension that is in the, the main quote template. You can do that if you want to, but you then could end up with inconsistencies within your estimate. So if you want to make that change to the ceiling height, best thing to do is to close down this dimensions wizard go back to the top of the screen and change the ceiling height there. OK, so green is telling you these figures are coming from the quote template screen. Some of them are white like this one. So that's just for a height of allows for a height of coursing blocks if you need them. They're zeroed out uh, as standard. And then there's a box here um, which is um, telling us about the number of identical walls. So sometimes when you're estimating, estimating in Estimator Express, you might want to um, estimate multiple identical walls. 
but in this case that's set to one because these dimensions here have come from the quote template and it knows the total length of wall is 11 meters we don't need to we don't need to double that up or anything so leave that set to one um, the gable dimensions are automatically calculated by estimator express as well so that's accounted for so if we click next when I say gables I mean the triangular areas of wall uh, at each end of the lean to the next screen deals with the foundation details so it's taken the uh, foundation depth below site strip from the quote template screen you'll remember we changed that from 900 mil to um, 1200 mil we've got the foundation width here now this is highlighted in it might display slightly differently on you, your screen. I think it looks a bit orangey, so it looks pale pink on mine. So that comes from the standard settings. So you can override the, the foundation width uh, within the standard settings if you need to. Again, if you make a change here, it will turn red. And that's just flagging up the fact that you are deviating from um, what you've got in your standard settings. So then we've got here um, an input for the thickness of stru structural concrete. And then there's an opportunity if you need to, to put a thickness of mass concrete. So if you're doing um, particularly deep um, excavations and you need to use a cheaper mass concrete as well as your structural concrete, then you can do that. That option, of course, is, is set to zero as standard because a lot of the time you will not need to. There's an option to plank and strut your excavation. Um, this comes from an option in the, in the standard settings, but because it's um, deeper than a meter, it's setting that to yes. Bulking factor, um, there's a little description, I should say. Um, I, I switched this on without telling you. At the bottom, we've got this box called show tech tips. If you tick that, Whenever you click into one of your input boxes, it will explain what the input box um, is looking for. So, and it, in this case, it explains what it does. So the bulking factor um, tells you how much the excavated material will bulk up by. So it, it's telling us it will take 50% more space when it's being disposed of via skip or tipper or redistributed around site. So I think that's a pretty standard um, industry figure 1.5 so it means it will take up 50 percent more space so you shouldn't need to change it but just so you know uh, what it means so if we click next the next screen as you can see deals with our footing we've got another tick box at the bottom here to show tech labels so they just add diagram labels so we can make sense of what's what so I'll uh, give you a moment. You can either hover your cursor over an input box or you can click into it to see the tech tip on the top right for an explanation of what you need to enter. So just spend a moment just um, looking at each of those different inputs and what, what needs to be put in there. Um, OK, so. If you use. Um, Sorry, this is set up to use trench blocks, but if, you, if you're not using trench blocks, you can zero out the height of trench block blocks and then uh, increase the height of block work below uh, DPC. Just, you just need to ensure your um, block work levels on, on both sides are equal. Or that the height to your DPC, I should say, is equal on both sides. OK, so the wall width and the cavity width here. Those have been updated with the figures that I entered in um, in the external wall section here. So the idea of them being on the main quote template screen is that if you are confident that the software is set up the way you like to work, so your footing dimensions are correct, you don't necessarily need to go into the dimensions wizard. You could just change the wall width, the cavity width here. It's to save you time if that's the only thing you need to change. OK, so 
we've got two options on the right hand side for um, is the wall insulated and is there a separate DVC? Those are set to yes, as you'd expect. And then the final screen deals with the plastering and decoration, so the finishing of the wall. So you can just take a moment to review the options here. So is the wall plastered? Is it decorated? Those are set to yes because we set the options on the main create template screen to plaster and decorate throughout. If you had set plaster and decorate uh, to not be carried out throughout, then these would be set to no by default. The same for your um, prime and priming and decoration of your skirting boards. So assuming you're happy with all those estimating options, we can click finish. So you'll see we haven't actually changed anything while we're in there. We've just reviewed the dimensions, um, but the software has keyed in all the, the important dimensions and estimating options that you selected at the top of the quote template so that you don't need to make any changes again, except for the wall width and cavity width in this case. So this is the point of a, a quote template is that you only have to enter the lots of the information once and then the software does all the processing and applies it to all the different um, parts of your estimate um, where it's needed. Okay, so we've just had a quick look at the dimensions. You might also want to have a quick review of the resources. So the next button along is the resources wizard. If you click where it says resources, um, we can hold our mouse over any of the items on the on screen. So we've got structural concrete there. It tells us what's been specified. Click next. We can have a look at the footing details. So we can see what trench blocks are being used, what the cost of those is, brickwork, blockwork, and so on. On the next screen, we can see the bricks that are being used. So you'll see. Um, the mini spec, mini spec that you selected, um, it should appear there where it says bricks above DPC. So I selected a 90 pence facing brick in the end. That's what the estimate's using. We can see what cavity insulation is being used. And then we can see what um, plasterboard and decoration and so on are being used. So from within the resources wizard, you can change any of these resources on the fly. So, for example, if a, a client has specified a change of resource and it's not part of the standard specification or specification you've chosen, you could make a quick change here. So, for example, if we go with that plastering to in a block wall, if you hover your cursor over it, I've clicked on it to highlight it in yellow, but I'm just hovering my mouse over it now we can see that we've got a square edge plasterboard, 12 and a half mil specified. But say, for example, that needed changing to a 15 mil thick plasterboard, we can change that using the options on the right. So we still want to use a plastering resource type, but we want to change the resource used. So if we click on the drop down box, this will open up the price book in the irrelevant section, so you'll see plasterboard square edge at the bottom. We just need to scroll down ever so slightly. You'll see the next item in the list there is a 15 mil plasterboard. We can see the price of it here, so it's six pounds 60 per sheet rather than six pounds. So if we click on the 15 mil board to select it, the edit resource um, dialog box will appear. We don't need to worry about any of this now, uh, the usage factor of this thicker board is exactly the same as the 12 and a half mil board because it's the same size board. So that the usage factor is fine. It's still part of the plastering phase. So we can just click OK. So all we've done there is we've swapped one type of plasterboard for another. So when you click in this drop down box, it's simply showing you the relevant section of the price book. And we'll come back to the price book in more detail during the next session. OK, so from in the resources wizard, you can re review the resources that are being used, the costs and quantities of them here. Um, 
The drop down at the, the bottom also allows you to swap and review the labour plant and so on. So you can see that um, we've got two plasters and a mate applying the plaster. Uh, and we've got a decorator doing the decoration. No surprises there. So if I just go back to the first screen foundation details, we can see what's been used or who's been used to excavate the trench. And then we can see the plant that's been used as well. So you can switch between material and the other resource types using that drop down at the bottom. OK, so I'm going to close that down for now. So once you have um, satisfied yourself that the dimensions are correct, you've reviewed the resources, you can make any changes that you need to there. There's a completed tick box on the right hand side here. This is purely for your reference if you want to be able to minimise those sections as you go along. So to remind yourself that you've worked through them, you can use that tick box. If you need to go back in at any point, you can just untick that box. It's not um, it's not set in stone. Again, it's just there to help you if that's useful. OK, so let's say we're happy with our external walls and we want to estimate the floor. So in the template, a specification has been selected by default but you can choose a different um, specification for your slab if required so say for example you want a ground black ground bearing and insulated slab you could select the second option down and there's also an option to select the floor finish as well if you need a floor screed as well so again, there's just one key dimension here that you can override if you want to without going into Dimensions Wizard. So let's say our slab is going to be 150 mil thick. We can click into the thickness of slab input box, click elsewhere on screen to register that thickness. Um, we'll just pop into the Dimensions Wizard and have a look at the slab dimensions in a bit more detail. So if we click the button under where it says DIMS. So you can see here the, the uh, green highlighted input box is showing us the total area of slab. So the quote template has fed that information into here. So it has worked out the overall area of the extension and subtracted the wall. Um, thickness off there of course it also will take into account yeah whether it's a suspended or ground bearing slab so it puts the total area in here it doesn't use the width and le length input boxes so here you can check you're happy just going to put the tech tips and tech labels on check you're happy with the thickness of the sand blinding and sub base You can see the thickness of the slab here has been updated so I can change it within the dimensions wizard I can change it on the main quick template screen it doesn't matter it will update in both places and then you'll see we've got a number of different options on the right hand side so we've got details such as is there insulation to the slab so because I selected an insulated spec of course it is uh, including insulation is there reinforcement below or above the slab again if I'd selected a reinforced slab then those would be set to yes. So a lot of it is to do with the specifications that you select at the outset. Um, is it going to be power float finished? I'm going to say no to that on this occasion. So I skipped over DPM and then you can type in the um, overlap of the DPM around the perimeter. And then the final screen allows you to check the plant allowances for the job, change them if you need to. So it's allowing four hours to um, to prepare the formation and sub base. But say, for example, I had an existing patio that I needed to break through before I could lay the slab. I might want to increase that to six hours or something. I don't know, just an example. Again, it's turning red. It's telling me that I have deviated from the template. I'm not concerned um, in this case. So you can review the rest of these 
pre-filled um, items. So how many days do we need a plate compactor? So it sets one day for a plate compactor, one day for a wheelbarrow, shovel, bolt croppers I'm not going to need, am I? Because it's not reinforced, so I'm going to set it to zero. I'm not going to need the power float. Number of deliveries and collections of plant is set to four, so let's say I'm happy with that. And then click finish. So there's not much to do there. We can review the resources in the same way as we did the walls, but for now we'll leave them as uh, they are. We won't go into everything in each section. I'm hoping that you'll just um, become familiar with the fact with where those dimensions are, where the resources are, where you can make those changes on the fly, um, so that when you come back in, you feel confident finding those different things. Um, one button I haven't talked to you about yet is the estimating calculator button. So for each section of the job or the element, um, estimating calculators are working behind the scenes, um, calculating those resource quantities and costs. And they bring together the figures that you've entered into the main quote template screen and the dimensions wizards. So it's the estimating calculator, which is um, calculating the quantities and the costs that you see in the resources wizard. But you can actually go into the estimating calculator and drill down and review the quantities and costs in there. And um, Jeff, if you've been estimating using estimating calculators, so using that fourth option from the new um, uh, from the new job wizard, um, this will be fairly familiar or very familiar to you. Um, so we're kind of going under the bonnet here. Um, but I just want to show you into the estimating calculator. Um, this is the old this is the old way of working. This is the way that the software started out. So it's more spreadsheet based. Um, but it it can be useful to come into the, the estimating calculator if you want to review all the dimensions at a glance. So you'll see for our slab here, we can see the uh, dimension of the slab or the area of the slab. Don't worry about the length and the width. Look at the overall area. We can see the length of perimeter insulation. If we scroll down, um, we can see things like the volume of sub-base, sand blinding, concrete that have been calculated by the software. So we can see those dimensions at a glance. So this is on the dimensions tab. If we click the next tab along, we can look at the calculated resources. So this shows which resources are being used. And you can see the quantities and the costs of each of the resources. So for example, we can see that for the slab itself, a ready mix concrete RC30, 50 mil slump has been um, estimated. If we scroll across to the right, we can see um, the total quantity. So it's saying we need 1.98 square meters, cubic meters, pardon me. And if we go further across to the right, it's then allowed for um, some wastage. So it's saying the total amount we need to uh, order is 2.13 cubic meters. And that will be at a cost of 234 pounds. So within the, the estimating calculator, we can drill down, we can see the resource that's specified, the quantities that have been estimated, and uh, the costs. And if anything feels wildly uh, wrong, then we can check whether we've input something uh, incorrectly or if we want to go into the price book and change the uh, cost there. We can see that it's uh, allowing £110 per cubic metre for that concrete. So for each material, there will also be a labour resource to fit or lay or pour or whatever that particular material. So if we go down screen, we will find a line which is called place and compact the concrete slab. So you can see the resource being used this time is a ground worker and um, mate. So 
their purchase cost in my software anyway is 36 pounds per hour and again if we scroll to the right you'll see they're they're doing the same volume of work aren't they um because they've got that 1.98 cubic meters of concrete to place <clears throat> um and that has been calculated as taking 1.42 hours at a cost of £50.97. Okay, so all of the estimating calculators are organised with the materials first and then the labour um, and any plant items as well. If we scroll down a little bit further, we'll see the plant that's been um, specified for this particular task. So for, within this calculated resources tab, you can see the full list of um, the quantities and costs and the resources. We've got a couple of different views, which I think are helpful. Um, these filter icons at the top allow you to filter to just show quantities. So if you don't want to look at all of the data in one go, you can click show quantities. Um, and it will show you the resource quantity. It will show you the wastage amount where applicable and then the total. Uh, order amount. You can also look at things like show basic costs. That will show you cost per item. You can show total costs if you want to look at the total costs, including wastage and so on. So if you want to understand uh, what's going on under the bonnet and how the software has come to the figures that it's giving you, then uh, this is the place to come and have a look. Or it's one of the places to come and have a look. OK, let's move on. Um, I'm conscious that we are. Um, the time is flying by because we're having having a lot of fun. Um, so let's let's move on to the roof. So we can either click the X at the top right of the estimating calculator screen or we can click close estimating calculator. If you click close, it will automatically save any changes that you've made in there. OK, so I won't go into floor finish um, because it works in a very similar way to the floor um, itself. So we'll just click completed for now. We'll assume we're happy with that. And now we'll have a look at the roof. So a cut roof has been specified. If you were using a truss roof, you could override that. We've got an additional um, input box here, which is asking us to select what type of ceiling we're putting in and what finishes you need. So let's say in this case, we're going to do a vaulted ceiling so we can select the option to plaster and insulate the rafters. Again, the software's gonna do a quick recalc. And we can have a look at the dimensions of our roof by clicking that dims button. So all of these are highlighted in green, meaning they're coming from the main quote template. So the software has calculated the clear span of the joist because it knows the uh, projection of the um, extension and the wall thickness here. So it's done that maths for us. The soffit width comes from the quote template as well, as does the roof pitch. So really, there shouldn't be anything you need to change um, in here. I think to start with, when you begin using the software, it's really, really helpful. It's important to understand what the software is doing. Uh, but as you get more familiar, you will know when you need to go into a Dimensions Wizard, when you might need to make a tweak here or there. Um, but for the most part, software should be doing the legwork for you. Um, so again, the software's calculated the eaves length. We've got our wall widths in there and our soffit widths taken from the main quote template screen. Joist centers and rafter centers, you might remember, are controlled by the standard settings. So they're set to 400 mil by default. If you need to make changes to those, I suggest you go back into the standard settings at the top of the screen and do that. Um, so we've got gable rafters, barge boards, number of rainwater pipes, number of gutters, length of rainwater pipe all set to um, sensible figures, so I don't think we need to change anything there. Um, gable abutment, um, 
this might confuse you if you're thinking, well, there isn't an abutment. Um, the software will always calculate the length of the abutment, so this figure here, but you'll see the number of gable abutments is set to zero, as we don't have one in this case. Um, we've got the spice, spicing, spacing of the tile lath, 300 mil. Again, that comes from the main crate template. Um, we've got the insulation overlap at the ceiling edge, set to 200 mil. Now, is the roof covered with sarking board? You'll see on my software here that's set to yes, and that's because I changed it in my standard, standard settings. So any estimates that I create in the future will automatically include um, sarking board if I click that save as defaults button. So you'll see how it feeds through. So make sure, as I say, spend 10 or 15 minutes looking through your standard settings and then everything should be uh, pre-set up as you need it. I'm going to switch it off actually for now. I don't really need it. Um, insulation to rafters is set to yes because we're doing a vaulted ceiling. Insulation to the ceiling, this could say flat ceiling really, is set to no because we don't have one in this example. And then as with lots of the Dimensions Wizard, the last screen is all about the finishing settings. So this should all be as we expect. So it's set to decorate, sorry, plaster and decorate the inside of the rafters. That makes sense. It's not going to prime and decorate barge boards and fascias because we're going to use PVC ones, UPVC ones. Same for soffits. And again, this is referring to the flat ceiling. Flat ceiling isn't going to be plastered or decorated because there isn't one. OK, so I haven't changed anything in there. All I've gone, uh, all I've done is gone through and explained what they're doing. Um, but because so much of it has been taken from the main quick template, there isn't really any work for us to do in there. So again, we could go into the resources wizard if we wanted to, to review the resources. Or if we wanted to, we could go into the estimating calculator, look at those quantities and costs uh, in there. We won't do that for now because time is uh, limited. And there are a few more elements I'd like to show you. Um, I think I'll probably keep going um, with talking you through the different sections if if you're happy with that, please do fire your questions my way. I don't think we've really had many so far, have we? Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, fire them to me as we go. I'm going to keep on going with what I'm um, showing you, and that will probably take us up to the end of the session. So we probably won't do like a separate Q&A session at the end, because um, I want to talk you through putting a structural opening in, plastering the connecting wall, and putting some um, bifolds and windows and stuff in there. So if you're happy with that, I'll keep going. So solar panels, we can ignore. Let's just set that to completed. Oh, same for the roof. Let's say we're happy with our roof. So structural openings. This works slightly differently. You'll see for any of the types of opening, whether they're structural openings, doors and windows, you start by selecting an option from the drop down box. So for your structural openings, you can either put an opening into a new wall. So um, if you are estimating an opening between a lounge and a uh, dining room in a new property, you would use that openings to new walls. Um, but what we want to do is put an opening in an existing wall because we obviously want to put the opening in the connecting wall between the extension and the existing building. So select the second option. You can then choose the size. This is like a template for the size of opening that you're going to be putting in. So if you have a look at the dimensions shown here, a small structural opening is anything up to the size of a door. Um, the one, the three at the bottom are for larger openings. So I'm going to go with medium opening, which is the fourth template down. Click OK to select that template. It then will ask you how many of these openings are you putting in. So if you're putting in two identical openings, you could set that to two. This comes into play when you're doing things like estimating windows and you've got several uh, windows of the same size. You can do them in one go. But for now, yeah, we'll leave that set to one. So now we're looking at the dimensions wizard that's opened up automatically. 
because we need to review the size of this opening. So it's set to three meters by 2.1, which is fine in this case. The uh, reveal depth is set to 300 mil, that's fine. The lintel bearing at each end is 150. Again, that's pretty standard. I'm going to leave it as it is. You've then got options about pad stones and uh, bricks and slates for packing. So um, I'm going to leave those as they are, but you can change those options as you need to. Here we've got the bulking factor. So in a similar way as we talked about the um, additional space that um, spoil from your excavations will take up when you knock down this wall and have to um, cart this brick and block work into a skip it's obviously going to take up more room in the skip than it does when it's laid so it's approximately double so I'm told so that that figure there will be used to help calculate how much of a skip you need for the spoil so wall thickness 0.3 that's fine and then we have got the plastering details here so these are set to yes, again, because we said we wanted a plaster as a whole throughout the project. Um, we've got the spacing of the noggings to the steels, the length of them here, and the number of angle beads. Change any of those if we need to. So I'm going to click finish for now. And one last thing to consider is where that structural opening is going. So the software has assumed that it's going into the existing connecting wall between the main building and the extension, which is exactly what we need. Um, it's giving you that option to put it in another existing wall. So, if, for example, if your client had said, I want you to build this extension and I want you to knock through my uh, dining room into my lounge, you could obviously estimate for that additional structural opening and that's, that's not actually connected to the uh, extension that we're, we're putting on but if it is for the extension um, then make sure you've selected the existing connecting wall option that's important because the software will then net off this opening from that connecting wall so if I bring that picture so it will know that it can deduct that opening area when it's calculating this plastering and decoration here I know this is an apex um, extension but I'm sure you can imagine there'll be that um, it'll be a rectangular area of plastering and decoration won't it okay so once you've estimated the opening you can then consider the plastering to the connecting walls so what this allows you to do is to plaster on the internal side of the existing wall and the external side, and you can have a different spec of um, plastering on each side. So if you look at the drop down box here, you'll see we've got options to plaster and skim, um, plaster and skim on battens with insulation, plaster and skim on battens without the insulation, and just a re skim on the interior. So you, you can select whichever specs most appropriate. Um, just to note that the default plastering system is dot and dab. So I've just seen Jeff, you have asked, is the steel size autom automatically input? So if we just quickly go in to the estimating calculator. Um, how it works is in the price book, the lintels are estimated on a, sorry, the lintels are priced on a per meter basis. So the reason we select the, um, the template for the size of opening is that the software will select an appropriate um, size weight of lintel. Um, so it's selected an appropriate lintel and it's worked it out on a meter basis. So it's saying we need um, 3.47 meters for each of those lintels. If, um, if you need a different weight of lintel, then you can um, change 
the lintel size. So say for, I think our maximum opening width, we, we say it's up to 4.2 meters, but if you were putting in say a five meter opening, you could use that largest opening size template, then come into the um, estimating calculator and, and swap the resource for a heavier duty lintel. Um, so does that answer your question, Jeff? I, it does automatically specify uh, the lintel and it works out the, the length of lintel. Yeah, okay, thank you. Right, I'll just close that down. So yeah, so we were saying um, we can select a different plastering spec for the inside and the outside interior and exterior of um, our connecting wall. So say for example, I needed to plaster and skim on battens on the external side of the wall. I can select that different specification. So again, you'll see you've got the, the same options available to you here. You can review the dimensions if you need to, check what resources are being specified, or drill down into the estimating calculator to look at the costs and quantities. Um, just to reiterate then that the software um, will deduct any opening and door areas from that connecting wall. Um, so it will know that, that that structural opening is in the connecting wall and it will net off uh, the plastering for that, that area. So you're not estimating for where you've got fresh air. OK, so I click completed. So let's just pop in our bifold door and windows now. This won't take very long at all. So with our doors, uh, it works in the same way. We start by selecting the type of door we want to insert. And scroll down near the bottom, you'll see, or about two thirds of the way down, you'll see we've got an option for a templated bifold door. If you select that, you can then select a size of door that you want to insert. So let's say we're gonna put a 3.6 meter five panel bifold aluminium door in. Again, it will prompt us with the number. So if you're putting two identical doors in, you could type two there and it will estimate them both in one go. So I've just got the one bifold on this occasion. If you want to add um, a stone head or brickwork arch detail, you can do that using these options here. Um, I should also note if you uh, make a mistake when you're opening any structural, when you're adding any structural openings or doors, windows and so on, you can delete them out. Um, you can also copy them if you want to create additional ones quickly. So I'm going to say I'm happy with that bifold. We can add windows in exactly the same way. So select the type of window you want to put in. So I'm going to say templated PVCU windows. Select the size of window, so we'll go for the 112C, 600 by 1200. This is just going to go in the side of the extension. Click OK. Again, change your quantity if you need to, or just click OK. And then for our window, again, you can add what we call the top treatment, so a stone head or brick arch, and you can also add stone sills if you need to. OK, so now we've added that external door and window. If we go back to our walls and look at the dimensions, you'll see that area of openings in the main wall has now got some data in. So it's added the area of the bifold and the area of the window that we've added and it's going to net those uh, that area so just over eight square meters off the brickwork block work insulation plastering painting and so on to that external wall okay so the the windows and doors any openings are not estimated 
that even though you can see them in the picture, I think it can be it can be slightly misleading. Even though you can see them in the in the picture, it's actually only estimating those solid walls to start with, and then you need to make sure you estimate your openings. Okay. Um, last thing that I just wanted to really quickly show you was um, from a construction perspective was estimating any wall starters, which is obviously relevant for our extension. So at the, near the top of the screen here, we've got this jump to section drop down box, which is quite handy when you want to um, navigate to a particular section of the quote. In there is a section called walling sundries, second from bottom. If we click walling sundries, then walling sundries will appear at the top of the screen here. If we click add estimating calculators, it will show us all the different walling sundries, um, which includes all, all sorts of different things from decorative uh, wall options, chimneys, um, got lintels below ground for our garages, parapet walls, all sorts of different things. But what we want is right near the bottom. We've got wall starters. Um, so whenever you see this dialog box here on the right hand side, you've got a, a little help sheet which explains to you what the estimating calculator will estimate. It might give you some tips on what you need to um, think about as you're estimating. So with wall starters ticked, we'll just click select. Select the height of the wall that you need the wall starters for. So we've got a 2.4 high wall. Click select. OK, so you could um, estimate your wall starters for each um, leaf of wall separately, but I'm going to do it for, for both sides of the extension on both leaves of wall in one go. So we've got four leaves at 2.4 metres, so that's 9.6 metres, isn't it? So in total, we need 9.6 metres of wall starter. So let's say we need, I don't know, two hours to fit them by the time you've... Uh, Ricky's got his drill out his van and found the right bits and whatever else they have to do. <laughs> um, there's an option to seal the joint and uh, an allowance for sundries. So if you need to... Um, uh, purchase any drill drill bits, for example. These things are consumable. They have a cost. It comes out of your um, back pocket in the end, doesn't it? OK, so let's click Finish. And we've added those wall starters. There's an option for toothing in for brickwork and blockwork as well, if um, that's something you need to do. I think I've heard that's less common these days, isn't it? wall starters seem to be the way to go okay so my hope is that I'm showing you a range of different um, sections of the quote template here so that hopefully you're getting a feel for how you review and enter the dimensions and how you can swap the resources in those different places okay so um, before we wrap up for today then I just wanted to show you some preliminary costs um, these are costs that are easy to overlook, um, but of course are very important and do add up quickly. So, um, yeah, I'll see how much time we've got. We'll make a start on this and get through as much as we can. So using our jump to section box at the top of the screen again, drop down box I should say there's a section called preliminaries and sundries about two thirds of the way down with the pound sign icon preliminaries and sundries sorry just having a quick drink trying to make sure my voice takes me through right to the end so if we select preliminaries and sundries um, the section you pick here will usually appear at the top of the screen. Only when you get to the sections right at the bottom of the screen, like prelims and sundries, there isn't enough <laughs> screen left for it to go up. But just so you know, usually if I pick external walls, that will come to the top or internal doors. 
it's just the items at the bottom <laughs> it runs out of runs out of screen okay so within preliminaries and sundries if you click add estimating calculators again you get this help but help box on the right hand side to help you figure out is this the estimating calculator i need i know sometimes it can be um difficult to know so hopefully that helps um i should point out here the calculators available to you on your particular software are dependent on the, the addition of the software you're running so some of the estimating calculators which are more of a new build um type so things like site acquisition um, may be grayed out on your version if you're using uh, estimator express core for example so um, what i would like us to have a look at next is site establishment so site establishment includes a range of different things um, from setting up the site security insurance health and safety costs and so on so make sure you tick the tick box click select then you can select a template um, for the size of job that you are estimating um, what the different templates do is they put in appropriate figures for the size of job that you are working on so if we go for a site establishment for small extension click select so the first screen here deals with um, some the hire of site cabin and toilet security fencing uh, a few different items that you need for the establishment of the site so lots of these are purchased in units of time so um, what that does mean is that you might need to come back in here once, once you've got a clearer idea of the duration of the job um, to make sure these figures are correct but let's say we need a site cabin for 12 days site toilet for 12 days we don't need security fencing zero those out we don't need a jcb to clear the site um, we're not setting up a site compound because it's a small extension uh, so we can leave that as it is and let's say yeah we're going to use one skip for site clearance click next the next screen deals with setting up a site compound so if you're building a house then this may well be relevant but for our training example we can leave these dimensions set to zero click through that the next screen deals with some other other costs that again you might easily forget um so skip permits skip parking bay suspension so if you're working in the city for example so let's say we don't need a skip permit we're going to use the customer's drive and then there's things like insurance costs so what you can do here is apportion some of your annual insurance costs to the job um, if you are um sorry i've got to that point where my brain seized so obviously there is a, an insurance cost to you and you can pass the relevant portion of that onto the client so if your annual insurance costs are um, 600 pounds and you're working with this client for four months of the year um, then you can put the relevant um, figure in there site security costs if there's any other costs um, things such as um, if you're on a bigger site and you've got a security guard a man with a dog or a um, if you're paying for regular um, I can't think what you call it surveillance someone popping by every now and again um, you can put in any security costs like that um, health and safety costs that covers things like your signage on site your PPE and um, we've got a separate estimated calculator for for COVID related PPE but just for general um, construction PPE health and safety consultation and so on you can put any health and safety costs in there and finally traffic regulations if you have to pay any traffic regulation costs so once you've done reviewing those you can click finish 
and then that estimating calculator will appear in the preliminaries and sundries section. So if we click add estimating calculators again, um, there's a couple more I'd just like to show you quickly if I can. So we've got sundry plant and travel costs. So sundry plant is for all those day-to-day -day sundry items that are not necessarily assigned to a particular task. So you saw we had um, plant items and tools specific to foundations within the external walls, but there may be items like ladders and um, other you know, general use items of plant which um, will get damaged, will need replacing through wear and tear. So you should you know you should be apportioning some of those costs to the estimate. We've also got travel costs, which is one that can quickly mount up. So I'd like to show you that. So you can tick multiple estimating calculators to add in one go. If you add mul multiple estimating calculators, they get popped straight into the relevant section and then you can click add worksheet to open them up. So if we click add worksheet next to sundry, next to sundry plant, and if we select small single story extension for our template, click select. Okay, so Sundry Plant contains an assorted list of tools and um, plant items that you might hire or you might buy. Um, so you can see that all of them are calculated in the number of weeks that they're going to be used for. So all you need to do is enter the number of weeks that each item uh, will be required. So I'll let you just cast your eye over those so you can see what's there. And when you do need to use them, you can come and find them in the Sudbury Plant Estimating Calculator. The next screen is for tool and plant purchases. Um, and again, the costs of all these items come out of your back pocket. So you should attribute the relevant ones to this estimate. Um, none of these things last forever. Um, you know, the client needs to contribute to the cost of these, otherwise they're just coming out of your, your profits. And we don't want that. Um, again, just take a, a moment to have a look at the items on the list. We won't, we don't need to put any items any figures into these um, items today, but just so you know where they are. Okay, so the final screen is where you can estimate your uh, spoil and waste plant higher. So again, um, you can put in the number of weeks higher for your rubbish chute or spoil conveyor and then the number of these extra components that you need if you do. Okay, so I'm going to click finish and then we'll speed straight on to the travel costs. So again, if we click add worksheet, we can open up the travel costs. So the top three input boxes here are for different sizes of van. So a small van is something like an Escort or a Focus size van. Medium van is like your standard transit van. Large van would be like a, a long wheelbase transit or a Luton type van. So select the van you use first of all. And then you need to think about how many miles per day you will drive to and from site. And then how many days you're going to be on site. So as an example, let's say I have a medium van. My journey to site is just five miles. So that's 10 miles a day there and back. The job is three months long. So let's say that's 20 working days a month. So that's 60 days. So I'm doing 10 miles a day for 60 days. Quick bit of math tells me that that's 600 miles I'm going to cover over the course of the job. Adds up really quickly, doesn't it? So if you had two identical vehicles doing a uh, similar distance, then you could just double that up and put 1200 in. Or if you had one medium van doing 600 miles and another small van that's only doing half that, you could you know, type 300 in for small van or whatever. Just write in the mileage per van. 
Um, so that's your mileage for the, the course of the job. Then we've got some options for daily parking fee. Again, more relevant if you are working um, in a city, I guess, but may, may affect you if you're in other areas as well. And then we have, um, so you would type in the number of days that you got to pay a parking fee. So again, you could type in 60 if you think it's going to be a 60 working day job. And then a uh, congestion charge. Again, you type in the number of days that you have to pay that. So it might be 60. The price of the congestion charge is set in the um, price book. So we'll come on to that next week in the next session, I should say. OK, so if you're happy with all of those items, click finish. And we'll actually just pop into the estimating calculator for the travel costs so you can see what the software is working out for those 600 miles. So adjacent to travel costs, if we click open the estimating calculator. Again, we can just see a quick summary of, summary of what we've entered. But the interesting information is in the calculated resources here. So you'll see for our medium van, it's calculating our expenses at 70 pence a mile. So that's going to cover you for things like wear and tear on your van, fuel, insurance, uh, depreciation. Um, it's obviously quite expensive, isn't it, running vans? So 70 pence per mile for 600 miles equates to 420 pounds over the course of the job. So if you calculate your travel costs in this way, that is something that the client is going to have to cover. And that 420 quid is not coming out of your bottom line. OK, so I'm going to click X for now to close that down. OK, so I'm conscious we've got five minutes left. I'm just going to show you one final section really quickly. And then I will let you get on with your day. But the final section I want to show you is a really important one. Just down um, towards the bottom of the screen, you'll see we've got the subcontract quotations section. Um, so again, we've got a drop down box here. You can click on the appropriate quotation type. So if you're doing um, an electrician subcontract quotation, if you're adding one, sorry, to your quote, then you select the electrical contractor or we've got plastering contractor um, but the one I'm going to use is the plumbing contractor so let's say I've got a um, plumber a sub subcontract plumber who's coming in and he's going to supply and fit a radiator and connect it up to the existing system and he's given me a fixed price for doing that job so where it says item used for just type of a brief description of the, the task that the um, subcontractor is carrying out. So I'm going to say supply and fit radiator and connect to existing system. This will appear in your customer quote. So make sure again that you type it carefully um, and make sure it's something that's clear and makes sense. So. Um, I don't know how much that will cost. Let's just say 400 pounds. The cost that you're entering in there is the cost excluding profit. The software will add your profit percentage onto there. Then you can select the appropriate bill phase from the bottom drop down box. This one is a little bit tricky because it straddles two phases i'm just going to put it down as first fix but of course he would need to come back when he for second fix so select your build phase then click ok and then you see that uh, subcontract quotation has been added to the quote and i can just go through repeat that process for any subcontract um, quotes that i need to add in it may be occasionally that you have the specific contract type that you want isn't there. So I don't know if you're having. I think I've added some of my own in here, like a specialist floor fitter. So you can go into the price book, into the master price book and add your own um, contractor types into the subcontract 
section of the price book if you want to or you can just use we've got a couple of generic options we've got general quotations we've got a specialist contractor um, so you can use those if there isn't a specific one that you want to use okay so just repeat that process to add as many subcontract quotations as you need and as I mentioned before your profit will be added on on top of those um, subcontract quotes okay so once you're done of course you can click completed so you can see our construction costs there on the top right hand side have been building as we've been estimating each of those sections and what I would do is just continue working your way down the screen if there's any items you don't need you can just click completed close them down now whenever I talk to tech support they say don't teach people to use the completed textbook uh, tick box because they think they have to use it and then they close everything down and it takes ages for them to go back into stuff so that's entirely uh, about your professional your professional your personal uh, preference that's what I'm trying to say um, use the completed tick boxes if they help you for me it just helps me get rid of the stuff that I work through and um, you know just mentally tick things off so I don't think I need to go back into it but whatever works for you is fine we talked about how in each section of the quote we can go into the estimating calculator and in there we can review the total quantities the, the costs and so on that the software has calculated for that particular section so I can drill down and look at roofs but if I want to have an overview of the whole estimate then the place to do that is the cost breakdown so at the top of the main quote template screen there should be a cost breakdown button depending on the size of your screen sometimes that button overflows onto the a second row underneath so if you can find that cost breakdown button and open up um, this screen this is a really uh, important part of the software so use the cost breakdown just to reassure yourself to satisfy yourself about what's been included in the estimate so there's three tabs within this window here so the first one gives you a breakdown of the cost organized by estimating calculator so for example we can see the, the cost of our brick and block cavity walls if you hover your mouse over one of the bars it will give you the total cost of that estimating calculator we can see the cost of our lean-to roof the slab the bifolds and so on if you single click on one of those bars so if I check, click the brick and block cavity wall on the right hand side then we can see a breakdown of the costs for that particular estimating calculator so we can see that includes the aggregate the concrete um, the blocks brickwork um, your carpenters time uh, ground workers time obviously bricklayer and so on so you can see how that total cost um, accumulates you might however find it more useful to have a look at the costs by build phase so I think builders tend to think in terms of build build phases rather than um, the, the estimating calculators that we use in the software so here we can look at the costs of the footing foundation and masonry shell separately so if I look on masonry shell um, you can see again that's broken down into aggregate blocks bricks and we've got the labor costs as well for the, the brick layer carpenter and so on so these bar charts give you a quick overview of the costs you can interact with them select a build phase and um, at a glance you can have a look at the cost for that particular build phase if you want to have a look in more detail then you can use the third tab which is called the editable resource breakdown so the editable bit there is to indicate to you that if you want to make some changes to the resources that are specified or the costs the prices against those resources you can do it from within this screen so we've got a number of filters across the top of the screen so we can filter the list to look at a particular estimating calculator or a particular bill phase so let's say we want to select a masonry shell we'll drill down and look at that a little bit more 
So masonry shell will include multiple estimating calculators. So we've got the brick and block cavity wall, um, the lean-to roof, the bifolds, um, PVC windows, wall starters. So those all have elements within the masonry sh shell phase, as you'd expect. You can also select a particular estimating calculator. So again, if we just wanted to have a look at the brick and block cavity wall, we can do that. And then we've got a shorter list of um, items to look at. As you can see there, we're using multiple filters um, at a time. So now we're looking at our brick and block cavity wall and we can see a summary of the quantities. So we can see the number of bricks that are being used above DPC. So there's 1,310 of those. And we can see the total cost of those. Equally, we can see for our blocks, we've got um, a standard insulation block being specified. We can see the, the rate per meter squared there, the total square meter, square meterage required and total costs and so on. Equally, you can see um, the labor costs. So if we scroll down, uh, we can see who specified. So laying those bricks and block work and fixing cav cavity insulation, we've got a, a two and one gang. We can see how many hours um, they're gonna spend doing each of those tasks. And we can see their rate here as well. Um, there's an option to hide any resources with a zero cost. Occasionally you'll have items zeroed out. You can click that tick box to get rid of any zero items if you need to. Yeah, so you can review those quantities and costs from here, but you can make some changes here if you want to as well. So say you look at your blocks above DPC and um, you realize that you want to use a different block. Maybe you want to use a solid dense concrete block instead. You can quickly make that swap from here. So if you click on the green price book button next to the resource you want to swap, that will open up the price book. So that's opened up the um, blocks, the block type within the price book. Um, and if we scroll down a little bit, we can see we've got the solid dense concrete blocks there. So I can select the solid dense concrete block, seven Newton, 440 by 215 by 100 mil. So you click on it to highlight it, then click select resource. Then we just need to review um, the usage unit. So when you swap a resource, uh, you have to consider um, the usage factor for that resource. So these solid dense concrete blocks are purchased by the square meter and the software calculates how many you need by the square meter. That's what the usage unit means. So it's a one to one ratio because I'm buying them in square meters and I'm using them in square meters. So that's all fine. I don't need to change anything there. Bill phase is still correct. Um, so I can just click OK. And there you'll see we're now using the solid dense concrete blocks in our estimate. and We can quickly see the cost there. So equally for our uh, laborers, um, to lay the blocks above DPC, we've got that two brick layers and a mate team. It's gonna take them uh, just over six and a half hours to lay our 21.83 um, square meters. If you looked at this rate and you said, well, actually my brick layers and a mate um, gang that I'm using for this particular job is a slightly different cost you can also edit the cost here as well so you can edit their price so to do that you use the next button along the edit resource button ah i've got mine set up slightly differently so yours will should appear something more like this so um i've played around with my labor rates so your unit cost might be slightly different. Um, so ignore that adjustment that was in there. I'm gonna to talk to you about adjustments in a minute. So my unit cost is 65 pounds for that, that um, gang. But if I wanted to change that cost, I can untick this box where it says update with download. And in the unit cost box, I can type in what I pay my gang. Let's say it's 70 pounds an hour. 
Once I've done that, I can click OK. The software takes a minute because um, it's going to go through the entire estimate and everywhere that that gang is used is going to update their rate. And it's telling me it's increased my job cost by £298. I'll just click OK. And we can see um, the cost of, of those bricklayers has been updated. And you can do the same thing for material prices. So just click the edit resource button and you can go in and change the price. So the changes that we're making here are, are only affecting this particular estimate. So we're, we're in this training estimate right now. The swaps that we're making are only affecting this estimate. If you want to um, make the changes to your master price book so that these changes appear um, in all of your subsequent estimates that you um, put together, then that's something you need to do within the library price book. And I'll, that's what we're going to be moving on to next. So these are just making changes for this particular estimate from here. Um, Mick, if you can't change the unit cost, that is um, because you need to untick that update with download box. So something like our solid dense concrete blocks, uh, the price of those comes from um, the HPXL price tracker plus uh, download. Um, so it's, it's linked to our web prices. So if you untick that box, you're basically overriding the um, the HPXL price tracker plus uh, prices. So that's why you need to untick it. So you're unticking it, but then you can't change the unit cost. It should um, make this cost appear in a, an input box and you should be able to just highlight and over type. Um, so I'm not sure why you might, if you have it still having problems with that, let me know. And again, I'll refer it to the, the tech support guys. Okay. so. That was just a quick overview of how the cost breakdown screen works and just to, to flag up that that's, that's a really good place to go if you just want to have a look at a glance at your estimate as a whole. So I'm gonna click close on that screen for now. Um, and then I want to move on to showing you the rooms section. So at the top of your screen using the jump to section drop down box, we can locate the room section about three quarters of the way down. So the room section should appear near the top of your screen. Now, as I mentioned very briefly at the start, the room section allows you to estimate um, room renovation tasks. So hacking plaster from walls, uh, replastering, skimming, um, fitting out tasks and also um, plumbing and electrics. So it allows you to estimate parts of the job where the room dimensions are required and it also allows you to uh, mentally separate out the tasks that you need to do within different rooms within a job so that you can ensure that you haven't missed anything. So for that reason you might prefer to do your plumbing and electrics um, in the room section if you're indeed estimating the, the, those tasks yourself. So the first thing we need to do is use the drop down box to select a room configuration. So there are rectangular, L shape and irregular options there. Um, and there are variations either with a flat or a vaulted ceiling. So for this extension example, we are doing a rectangular rectangular room with a vaulted ceiling. So if we select that fourth option down, rectangular room with vaulted ceiling. Then this box will prompt you to select a description for the room. Um, the description will help you um, just cat, you know, um, list the different rooms so you know which is which is a labeling thing, but it also um, begins to um, tell the software what kind of elements you might want in that room. So if you select a bathroom and then you want to add a group of plumbing items, it will know that you need a different set of plumbing items. And if uh, it were a kitchen or um, a reception room, for example, so um, select the most appropriate room description. If there's not one in there that, that works, you can type in your own. But then of course the software won't be able to 
predict what you need in there. So if we select dining room, and we then need to enter the dimensions of the room. So with our little lean to extension, um, it is a one room extension, isn't it? But obviously a lot of the time you're going to be uh, estimating projects that have multiple rooms. So the software doesn't know, it doesn't know yet what the size of those different rooms are. So we can type them in here. So the length of our room is 4.4 meters in this example because it's five meters and then we subtract the wall widths. The width of the room is 2.7. The height of the walls is 2.4, so we can leave that. The pitch of the ceiling is 22, so those have been picked up from the quote template screen. The ceiling slope, um, I always think is a little bit confusing, but if you imagine the picture at the top of the quote template screen, our existing property is at the top, and our extension projects down the screen so it does the ceiling does slope up i think we could do with them um, the original quote template image being here so that you can kind of orientate yourself but yeah select the direction the ceiling slopes up in and it, in this case it's fine as it is so once we've input the room dimensions we now need to tell um, the software about any openings within the room so that it can accurately calculate wall areas. So there are two ways we can do this. We can link an estimated opening. So that means an opening that we've already estimated, we can associate it or link it with this room. The other thing you can do is if there are openings which you haven't estimated, you can add them in manually. So um, we can link all of the openings that we've already estimated so it's a nice quick job for us so all we need to do is tick the boxes of the openings which are associated with this room and in this case because it's one extension one room it's very straightforward so that window that bifold and that opening are all uh, in the walls of this room that we're adding now so we can just tick them all click OK so now the software is going to deduct those openings from the wall areas so if we do any plastering tasks or decoration or um, anything involving those wall areas it knows about those openings okay so what we're going to do now is add some electrics for this particular room so towards the bottom of the screen you'll see that there are options to add estimating calculators so that includes all the fitting out and renovation tasks. We can add a group of electrical items or we can add a group of plumbing items. So if we select add a group of electrical items, now we get um, some tabs with all the different room types on. So if we click living rooms, because we, we're working on a dining room, you'll see dining room has been ticked and it's got a quantity of one. If you were doing a property with very similar sized rooms and you wanted to um, add the electrical components for those rooms in one go, then you could put quantity two or quantity three. You know, if you're doing bedrooms and they all need the same light fittings and sockets and so on, you can do them all in one go. But for now, we'll leave that quantity set to one. And what the software does is it automatically selects some electrical components that it thinks you might need for a dining room. So it does it a bit quietly and pops them at the bottom. So you're going to need to scroll down the screen to see what it's added. So this is like a, a starting point, a, a serving suggestion. You can, of course, delete anything you don't want. You can change the quantity. You can swap items and so on. So it has um, inserted two ceiling roses, two wall lights, and three double sockets. So um, let's say the client doesn't want any wall lights at all. We can just get rid of those. Just press the adjacent X button, the delete button. It will check that you, you're sure you want to do it. I'm just click yes. So that's got rid of those. Say the client has actually asked for a USB double socket. We can add that in. So where it says electrical sockets, if we click add worksheet, 
then we can um, locate the double socket with USB, where is it, downstairs. Double socket with USB downstairs. Click on it to select it. Add it in. So it, oh, everything you add gets popped to the bottom, so you'll need to scroll down. So we've got one double socket with USB, so we might want to adjust the number of double sockets to two. Or you could remove the double sockets and put three USB sockets or whatever. I don't know what people do these days. It's always handy to have a USB socket, isn't it? Um, so in this way, you can see you can add in other components that you want. If there are another lighting component that you needed to add, you could just click Add Worksheet, delete or change the quantities as needed. So the software is just giving you a serving suggestion of electrical items that you might want for that type of room. And if we'd selected um, bathroom as the description, it would give us a different set. It would give us um, a shaver socket and um, I don't know if it includes a pull switch. It used to include like a, a pull light switch, but I think um, I don't think it does anymore because you tend to have your sockets on the your uh, switches on the outside of the, the bathroom now, don't you? Um, and yeah, it would be different again for a kitchen. So in the same way, you can add a set of plumbing items. So it will know a typical reception room. It will look at the um, the area of the room. So it uses those room dimensions to work out the area, to work out the size of radiator and so on. So it's doing some of the work for you there. So those are component based items that you can add to the room. If we click add estimating calculators, we can also um, have a look at how we can add a dimension based task. So you'll see there's actually an extensive list of estimating calculators that you can add to the room. Um, I'm just scrolling down, there's hundreds of them in there. Um, but what I'd like us to uh, estimate is an engineered wood floor. I just click engineer and then press, sorry, if I type in engineer, then click the search button or you can press the enter key. Then it should locate for you engineered wood flooring estimating calculator. The help on the right hand side tells you what it estimates for that particular um, component. And then we can click select to add it into our room estimate. Oh, I think I had accidentally selected something else. So I'll get rid of that. When you select something from add, estimate, add estimating calculators, it will normally, and I think it probably has at your end, the dimensions wizard will, will pop up straight away. Okay, so you can see the floor dimensions have been pulled from the room dimensions, so it knows the area of the floor and it knows um, the perimeter of the uh, floor. So it's a case of just reviewing uh, things such as the cost per square meter of wood flooring. So say the clients pick something that's 35 pounds per square meter, you key in the cost there. Check the beading and the skirting options. So it says here length of skirting, I'm having a look at the tech tip here, length of skirting to remove and refit. So that's for existing skirting. This is a new room, so we don't actually need to remove and refit anything. So we can zero that out, it's not relevant. Perimeter beading, we'll leave that as it is for now. On the next screen, you can specify whether you want underlay and whether the floor needs to be leveled. You can enter the number of threshold door bars um, needed. If there's any sundry costs that you need to add in associated with the type of floor you're putting in, you can type those in there. So you don't need to do any door easing either, so we'll zero that out because it's assuming you're doing it in a, in a renovation context, but um, for this extension, we wouldn't need 
um, to allow the time to do that. So if we click finish, there we can see the engineer wood flooring has been added and we can see a summary of the dimensions of it there. So it allows you to add another area. So if you were, for example, um, putting flooring in a cupboard, you could add that on in the, in the other areas. So that's just a quick tour of how you can um, estimate dimension-based tasks as well as um, kind of more component-based based tasks in a room. So I've talked about how you can estimate plumbing and heating in the room section. Just a warning with that, um, take care when you're estimating your, your electrics and your plumbing and heating if you've got those in your software. Um, make sure you don't allow for those elements twice. So you can estimate those elements within the room section. You can estimate them as subcontract quotations as we talked about on Tuesday. You can also estimate them. If I just close down the screen for a moment, you can also estimate them within. Um, we've got an electrics section to the quote and a plumbing section to the quote. So you can estimate them there as well. Just make sure you don't estimate them in all those different places. Otherwise, you could end up duplicating or triplicating, triplicating, is that a word? Um, all of those costs. So choose how you like to work. There's probably a, a way that you work already. Choose the method in Estimator Express that close, most closely matches the way you prefer to work. So whether it's doing it on a room by room basis, use the room section. If you just if you just get subbies in, then of course you don't need to do that add them in as subcontract quotations. If you like to go through and pick um, all of the elements out yourself, line by line, you can do it in the plumbing and electrics sections. So if I go back to the rooms section, you'll see our dining room has been added there. It gives us a summary of the uh, square meterage, the number of openings in it, and the number of items that you've estimated. You can click edit to go back in, add in any other tasks that you need to associate with that room. And of course, you can add as many rooms as you need to your estimate. So if for this client you were doing the extension, but you were also going to be um, doing some renovation of their kitchen and their lounge, then you could add those rooms in as well um, and estimate any renovation tasks or fitting out tasks and so on that you're going to be doing in there. OK, so that's a quick overview of the room section. The final thing, as I mentioned, that I'd like to show you is the um, the tool for adding additional templates. So there's many different situations um, in which you might want to add an additional template to your main quote template screen. So um, it might be that you've selected a house template, but there's an, another projection on your design that you need to add on. It might be um, that you are estimating um, a, a, an extension and a garage conversion. So there's two different sections of the, the project, but you want to bring them together into one quote. You can do that using an additional template. The only uh, thing I want to say, I think, I think none of you guys said you do, do new build work at the moment, but if you want to estimate several houses, you would need to estimate each of the different houses um, in a separate estimate. So within one estimate you only want to um, estimate the costs um, of work within one plot or one property so um, if we scroll down to the bottom of the main quote template screen you will see there's a section called additional templates and if you click add additional template you'll see the options that you've got for adding an additional template, another bolt on to what you've estimated so far. So you can add anything from a house, um, which would kind of probably be the wrong way around of do doing it. Um, you probably start with a bigger template and add it on smaller ones, but you could in theory add a house, you can add uh, a garage, um, a renovation task, which you would do using the bottom option or um, some sort of garage. 
Just a note about the differences between projections and extensions. So the bit in brackets is really important here. So if you want to bolt on an addition, so an additional template to a house or a bungalow or an extension that you've just estimated, so a house or a bungalow or an extension or garage even, which is new, you need to select a pro the projection option. Uh, an extension attaches onto existing walls. So the, the building has to be in existence already, whereas a projection attaches on to new walls. And the reason it's important to select the right option here is um, that the projection and the extension handle the connecting wall differently. So for a projection, Estimator Express will substitute the external wall details on your connecting wall um, with the appropriate um, internal wall and it will allow for the formation of the opening in that wall. So the projection template will take into account the material saved by the opening in the connecting wall and the fact that it's an internal connecting wall, not a, um, a cavity wall. In contrast, the um, extension templates, um, they will allow for the formation of the opening in that connecting wall, um, but it won't substitute the cavity wall for internal wall um, specification. So that that's the main difference. I hope uh, I hope that's clear. It is it is quite an important thing. So if if in any doubt, just read the bit, the bit in brackets. So if you're extending an estimated building, as we've just done here, then you select a projection. If you want to uh, estimate something which is attaching to an existing building, then choose the extension. Okay. So. We won't go any further into additional templates because once you've selected your template and you go into it, the screen is very much like this main quote template screen. Um, it's just another layer with um, that extra template in there. Okay, so that concludes module one and the estimating side of things. Thank you so much for your time and your concentration today because I know that's an absolute whirlwind. We've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, so if anyone has any um, burning questions they'd like to ask now, then please do so. If anyone has got somewhere that they urgently need to be, then uh, please feel free to, to leave uh, at your leisure. Um, and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Uh, just a quick reminder, Thursday's session, is we'll go in and look at the, the price book and spend some time tailoring the price book um, for your different situations. Um, so that's Thursday. 12.30 till 2.30 and I look forward to seeing you there if you if you can make it that would be brilliant um so yeah so if you need to go please do if um you'd like to stay I can quickly um answer any questions if any pop up and I can just speed through our quiz questions if you want to do any of the, the quiz the quiz to recap there's only I think it's three or four questions it's not uh, onerous um but it's just a chance for me to just drive home some of the points that we've covered today. Okay, so let's um, bring up the poll questions. Okay, in fact, there might not even be four. Right, so the first one is about swapping a material. Based on what we've done so far today, because there's a couple more bits that I'm going to show you during the next session that um, we haven't been into yet. So just thinking about what we've done today, where can you swap a material? So, for example, if you wanted to swap the wall insulation, where would you do that? In the resources wizard of the relevant section, in the estimating calculator, in the price book or in the cost breakdown? And we haven't been into that yet. So. We'll uh, look at that at the start of the next session. OK, thank you to lots of you who voted. I'll, I will speed through these so I don't take up any more of your time than I need to. OK, so 
80% of you have correctly identified that you can swap a resource in the resources wizard. So we saw how we can look at the diagrams, click on a particular resource, and then using the drop down on the right, we can swap a resource. So yeah, spot on. You can swap a material, particularly if you just want to do an odd resource on the fly, you can do that in the resources wizard. People who said we can also do that in the estimating calculator are spot on. You can swap your resources um, within the estimating calculator using the change resource button. So either of those places um, you can. The price book, um, you don't swap resources in there. That's just like a, a catalogue of all of the different materials we've got or resources we've got. And the cost breakdown, actually, you can swap a material in there as well. But as I said, I'll, I'll show you that at the start of next session. So brilliant job on that first question. OK, so next question we've just touched on. Um, so where should I put a fixed price quote from a subby for a certain part of the estimate? So where do you add that to your estimate? In the appropriate section of the quote template, i.e. the um electrical or plumbing and heating section and so on or do you put it in the subcontract quotation section at the bottom or is that something that you can't do and you've mostly answered before i even finished reading the uh yeah potential answers okay so again i'll close this quickly so spot on yeah use the subcontract quotation section so if it's for um, a task that has been quoted by one of your subbies, pop it in the subcontract quotation section. Um, if you want to estimate it and you want to have a breakdown of it within the estimate, then you can, of course, use the relevant section of the quote template. So if, if you want to estimate for the electrical work, you can do that within the electrical section. Um, but if you've just got a, a fixed price quote, stick it in the... Um, so contract quotation section. OK, thanks for that. Following on from that, what figure should I enter for a subcontract quotation? Is it the quote amount plus VAT and profit, the quote amount plus VAT but excluding profit, or the quote amount excluding VAT and excluding profit? I think I don't think I mentioned VAT actually. See what you guys think. I think you've probably extrapolated out from what I've said about the way the um the costs work because you've correctly all said you should enter the, the um quote amount excluding VAT and excluding profit. So VAT is added on when you create your customer quote as is um, your profit so any figures that you enter into the estimate itself into the estimate itself are excluding VAT and excluding profit so that's that's spot on thank you and okay I think I'll leave it there for today I think some of the other bits we'll, we'll touch on at the start of the next session so um Oh, I've just seen a couple of questions. So Jeff's asked, once the job has been estimated, does it give you an estimated time scale to complete the job? Uh, what it does do is it, it puts together the bill program based on the, the labour calculations within the estimate. Um, and so that will give you an estimated end date. Um, we always say with the bill program, though, it, you need to apply your human judgment um, to it as well, because you're going to be aware of the speed of your workforce. Any, um, you know, you might have periods where people are off on holiday or um, complications with the job that are going to make things take a bit longer. So that's the caveat there that you you need to apply what you know about the job, what you know about your team and available workforce and so on um, when you're uh, using that information. Um, Mick has asked, does the software size roof timbers? 
So um, the short answer is it puts together a timber cutting list for your um, roof timbers. So I'm going to go back into the roof and I'm going to have a look at the estimating calculator. Um, so the software has um, pre-specified timbers, sizes of timber for the different um, parts of the roof, as you'd expect. So scroll down here. Actually, we'll look at cal in calculated resources. So, so what I've done is gone into the roof section. I've opened up the estimating calculator. And from here, we can see the sizes of the timbers being used for our roof joists. So we've got 150 mil timbers for our joists and our uh, roof rafters. 100 mil timbers for our <clears throat> wall plate and so on. Um, so this is where the timbers are specified. If you want to do swap or override those, then you can change any of those. So if you needed to use a, a thicker timber, then you can come in here and swap over. I've got obviously a, an extensive uh, catalog of different timbers. So that's where the uh, timber sizes come from. Um, if we go back to dimensions, just, it's been a little while since I've done it. Ah, here we go. So within the dimensions tab, if you click filter material quantities, here you can see you get a list of um, the different timbers and the number of meters that you need. Yeah, and the and the resource specified. So if you want to um, review your reef timbers, go into the estimating calculator for your reef. And if you want to see that summary of the um, timbers that you're going to need, click mater uh, filter material quantities. So hopefully that's helpful to you, Mick. If you have a um, smart scheduler, I think it goes um, it goes one further and I think it ca calculates the, the exact amount of timber that you're going to need to purchase based on the, um, you know, the length the timbers can be purchased in versus the, the length that you need. I think it goes one step further. Um, but if that's something you, you'd like to talk to um, tech support guys about, they, they uh, understand that a little better than I do. Okay, right then, assuming there's no further questions, it uh, just leaves me to say thank you so much for your time today. I really look forward to talking to you again on Thursday. If you've got any queries in the meantime, please do um, get in touch with us, give um, tech support guys a call. We've been a little bit sh short staffed um, last few days. Unfortunately, Tom's been unwell, but he is back. Um, I believe tomorrow. Um, so yeah, give us a shout and um, we obviously want to support you as much as we can when you're at this like crucial stage of, of finding your feet with the software. Please do practice if you've got the chance, um, if you've got the chance this afternoon while it's fresh in your head or this evening or you know as soon as possible. Spend a bit more time having to play around and if you've got a simple project um, of your own that you can have a go at estimating that that would be ideal but okay thank you so much for your time guys take care and I look forward to speaking to you again on Thursday cheers then bye